Hello everyone, and welcome to Sunday Morning Coffee with Book Passage, a weekly show where we collect all our favorite moments from last week's free author interviews. If at any point in the video you decide you'd like to see the entire conversation with the author and not just the couple minutes we've selected for you, at the top right hand corner of each clip we've pinned a link to the original video. Just click the image that looks like an eye and select the appropriate author from the sidebar. Thank you for joining us for Sunday Morning Coffee. We really appreciate it. Now on to the show. And that's, that, that was how the broad outline of the Gardener of Eden happened. Now with Red Riviera, it was very different. Um, in part because it was something that I wanted to write about 25 years ago, maybe even more than 20, I can't remember. Um, but um, I'll tell you a strange anecdote. And let me start. This is all an answer to your question, by the way. Um, <laughs> have you ever slipped, physically slipped on an anchovy? No. I don't know many people who have. <laughs> but that's what happened to me. Oh. Okay. So you know that my wife and I are great hikers, right? That's what I'm doing right now. I'm in the Alps hiking and I'm in a B&B in this little remote village using their connection. So we hike everywhere. And we were hiking in the Ligurian outback. That means the area above the Italian Riviera, right? It's very rocky and very steep. And it's just like California. It's always catching fire as you know from the novel. And there are wildfires constantly. And there are these uh, airplanes, uh, seaplanes, uh, Canada Air, as they call them, because they're mostly built by a manufacturer called Canada Air. And they come down and they scoop up the water and they dump it on the flames, right? So we're walking up in these hills, way away from the sea. And I slipped on something shiny. And I looked down. And I thought, what the hell is it? And it was a, a, an anchovy, a whole anchovy. And it was like almost alive. And then we, I looked around and it, yeah, there, it had burned nearby. And one of these planes had come down and scooped up the oh, wow. water. And in the water, there were all these fish and they rained down on the hillside. And wow. so we were hiking and I slipped on the anchovy. And then I was looking out from there at the airplane dipping down and picking up the water. And that was it. I had the whole novel in my head. And that was, 20, <laughs> that, that was 25 years ago. Wow. So what he meant by that was, so at the time, let me just set the context. At the time, Von Neumann has just helped create the hydrogen bomb. So create one of the weapons he's trying good, to protect. Know, good job. I mean, whether or not you like the hydrogen yeah. bomb, good job. So good job. Do. Yep. Good job, John Von Neumann. Um, <laughs> and he is acting as one of the national security advisors. He's on the advisory council. He's basically involved in all of the big strategic decisions of the day. And we're in Cold War, right? This is like the peak everyone thinks that everyone's going to blow the, blow the crap out of everyone else. Um, and here's this guy who grew up in Europe, um, is living in the United States, working in Princeton with Einstein, you know, with all of these brilliant minds. He sees this happening. He says, how do we model it? Like, how do we actually approach it from a perspective that's semi-solvable, that we can actually have a prayer of not getting into a nuclear war, not getting into that kind of situation. And poker offered kind of a game way of looking at it. And a game is a really actually powerful tool for thinking about real world decisions because it's cleaner. It's not real life. All of the noise, all of those variables disappear because there's only so much you have to take into account. Now, of course, if you realize that you're dealing with a game of no limit Texas Hold'em, the number of situations that can arise there are bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So you're still dealing with insane possibilities, but at least 
you're in a setting where you can observe the variables, where you can calculate probabilities. And what poker is, is a game of, like I said, incomplete information. So there's stuff that I know that you don't know. There's stuff that you know that I don't know. There's stuff that both of us know. And then there's how we present ourselves and kind of the things that we portray and choose to show. Then there are the things that we think we're hiding and that we might not be hiding. And when you start breaking apart all of the different levels, all of a sudden you realize, wow, this looks a lot like, you know, a high stakes political negotiation over, am I going to fire those nukes or not? You know, am I going to go batshit crazy on you or not? Who's kind of, who's the one who's going to win this confrontation? Who has the goods? Who has the balls? Who has the psychological warfare down? It's all of these different factors. And that's what he meant by, if I can solve this, if I can figure out in a game setting how to win over and over and over, then I've got this, then I've got the key to approaching all of these high stakes negotiations. And of course, like I said, unfortunately, it hasn't been solved because it's really complex. And even though we now have some AIs that can solve one on one. So if you know, you and I sit down, they can probably help one of us beat the other person if you and I were both great players. Um, and you know, best players in the world sit against a computer, they can do one on one and win. But as soon as you get a full table, of even six players, not to mention seven, eight, nine, they fail. They can't do it because it's also reading faces and reading gestures and reading all of this nuance and dynamics and multiple people who could be collaborating and you have no idea. And it really is like a high stakes negotiation table. And so I can see why he would choose that game. It's still, even if you look at it in poker terms, it's still a very high task, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big ask. So the father or one of the fathers of the hydrogen bomb says, I, if I can do this, I can do anything in you, Maria Konnikova, you're having a bad year. You're like, well, I'll just do this. There's, <laughs> yeah. there's a fair amount of hubris baked into that. You couldn't solve it. I'll do it. <laughs> let, let me take over from here. <laughs> this for you. Okay. So this is um, from the second scene of the book. Um, the main character, who you know is Therese, she's 11. She's been playing in the cassava field in, um, with her little brother Felix and his friend Virgil. A militia group has just invaded their village. And um, this is, you know, kind of um, finding her as she wakes. Um, Virgil crawled out from his hiding place between the cassava plants and shook Therese gently. He, he tugged down her dress because he didn't want to see the blood from what happened to her. She didn't move. His knees were sore from crouching so long in the field. He shook her again and her eyes fluttered open. We need to go, Therese, before the men with the guns find us. He grabbed her hand. She struggled to her feet like a baby goat. He pulled her out of the cassava field toward the dark woods that their parents told them were not safe. Behind the children in the golden sun, smoke rose from their village. It was not from their cook fire. Therese shook as she ran up the wet, slippery hill. Pole, pole, step by step, struggling to keep up with Virgil. The sun dipped, dimming their final steps to the forest. At the edge of the trees, screaming and gunfire reached their ears. Therese could not clear the smoke in her head and she sat down harder than she meant to. It hurt a lot. Virgil had made it to the top of the hill without fighting for, for breath. He was not even winded. Although he was only 10, he was the fastest in the village. The best soccer player, the cleverest at catching fish. His papa, Father Alexandre, was the priest at their church on the long road and demanded excellence of him. His papa and her papa would both scold them for being out after dark. We need to go back, Virgil. Our parents will be angry. We need to go home. He swatted at her as if she were an irritating mosquito even though she was older by almost two years. He leaned in close and hissed in Swahili. Don't you see, Therese? There's no home now. She looked down at their village and saw smoke rising high against the evening sky. Until that moment, she had never been afraid of anything. She felt abandoned by nearly everybody now. Where's Felix? Is my little brother still playing in the cassava field? Is he hiding from the bad men, she thought. 
She put her hand to her cheek. The skin was rough like a pineapple. She looked down at herself. Her favorite Sunday dress was ruined. Therese stood. Wetness poured out of her and made a puddle at her feet. Why do I hurt so much there, she wondered. Blood soaked through the green fabric. She held her hands in front of the bloody dress and felt a piece of paper in her front pocket. She unfolded the scrap and found Felix's message. It was written in English, the language Mama gave them. I am here, Felix. And then she remembered, and she fell down into a merciful blackness. I work very hard on resilience. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I don't think people can like wish themselves into becoming a different person, but I think that there are definitely skills that we can work on. And for me, resilience is, can feel like a lot of like, sort of just redirecting my mind again and again. And, um, you know, something I talk about in the book, my grandmother's spiritual practice was Zen Buddhism and she was very faithful and very good at it, but she would never talk about it because it's not really the kind of thing that like you can explain well. And she's like, well, if you're interested, you can, you know, why don't you, why don't you look into it? You know, which is a very Zen thing to say. Um, but you know, I inherited a lot of her books. And so I, to me, like resilience is setting aside, you know, what you can't fix in the moment and just focusing on like, what is ahead of you right now? Like, are you, are you, whatever you are being called upon to do, are you really focused and are you here? And resilience to me is, you know, something I work on in terms of, you know, even just like having a dialogue with myself, like, okay, I hear you're feeling really like this right now. And I hear you thinking that this is going to last forever, but like, Let's talk about it. Did Hurricane Katrina last forever? Did your divorce last forever? Did the psych war last forever? You know, did the quarantine, well, the quarantine might last, we don't know, TBD. Did, did those wildfires last? You know, like things are discrete chunks of time. And to be able to acknowledge like, this is really terrible. I really hate this right now. And I can just hate it. And maybe I can figure out some self-soothing things in the moment. And then maybe later I can try to figure out what I can take from that and what is useful. And then I just have to do my very best to set the rest of it down, to set down the anger or to set down like the, why me? Why did this happen? This shouldn't have happened to me, you know, to set down that stuff because those just really aren't useful thoughts. And then sometimes I want to sprint back and like pick it up again and, and like return to these cherished thoughts of, you know, feeling self-pitying or feeling angry or whatever. But then it's just really like, okay, but like, why are you carrying all that shit around? Like, is it doing anything for you? Okay, well, let's go put it down. And then when you pick it back up again in 10 minutes, then we're going to put it down again. And we're going to do that again and again forever until I'm dead. So um, I have done... I, what I would say are fairly amateurish doodles in all three of my books. Now I've always been a doodler. Um, and there's, there's a lot of really silly ones. Um, like there's one of like my uterus is a tumbleweed. Um, 